Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Patricia and Nick Shaw for inviting me, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here to share <coughs> our experience uh, from Sheffield. Um, because we use a lot of industry implants, I don't have any uh, sort of conflict of interest to declare. The talk, I'm just going to talk initially about the goals of treatment, the orthopedic aspects, uh, a bit about uh, pre-bisphosphonates and post-bisphosphonates, how it has changed a bit of orthopedic uh, operating and techniques, our experience, some challenges and conclusions. So the overall goals of treatment are to maximize function, minimize the disability of these children and get them to allow social integration and possibly make them relatively independent with the best most possible degree of mobility which we can provide and also maintain the overall health. And to achieve this, I think uh, the team approach is the most important. As you know, we are four centers with a big team. Uh, our team has expanded, especially on the metabolic bone side with Prof. Bishop. Uh, in the surgical team, we are now three surgeons, uh, Steve Giles, Nick Nicolau, and myself. Uh, Mr. Bell, whom many of you may know, is retired now. It's about three years since he retired. So what are the indications for surgery? We mainly is to prevent and reduce fractures and any bone which is bent uh, it will tend to break very easily, especially with pathological bones. So we correct deformities and thereby improve the mobility status and thereby function. I'm not going to talk about bisphosphonates, but as you know, it's made a big difference. And what was treatment in general for orthopedic management? A program of mobilization and bracing from uh, as they start with the help of physiotherapists and occupational therapists. At some point in time, most of these children will need some internal support for these long bones which break very easily. Some people use plates and I think they should be contraindicated in isolation. Usually we rod them. Uh, occasionally we may have to use a plate in addition to the rod. What about timing of surgery? Uh, when I first started in Sheffield, we were still a bit conservative. We never used to do before the age of five. Partly for many reasons, uh, we had big weight lists. Uh, uh, we were concentrating more on the lower limbs. Gradually, things have changed uh, with bisphosphonates as well. And suddenly we realized that uh, with bisphosphonates, certain technical challenges were coming. So possibly we may have to rot these uh, bones very early. So at the moment, we rot them depending on, of course, each, each individual child has his own sort of, uh, we have a different philosophy. It's all treatment is individualized. And we can do as early as they have good sitting balance and probably a potential to stand. Does severity matter? Yes, like the CT scan of a child, you can see here, severely bent bones. Pelvis has got what is called protrusion. It becomes very difficult for them to sit and these bones can break easily. So I think the type threes possibly should be rotted uh, quite early rather than keep them non-operative. And it becomes very difficult when children come to us between the age of 13 to 16 from elsewhere to rot them because there's no canal now, because the canal is now sort of the bisphosphonates of working so well. The, the canal in the bone, which is like a tube, which is good for strength, becomes more like a cylinder and it breaks more easily like marble bone. If you operate early, there are also risks involved. So anesthesia, as you know, there are risks of, uh, uh, there are quite a few risks which I'll go through. Uh, surgical, there are, any operation will have complications and metabolic as well. Should we operate one segment at a time? Uh, if you do that, there will be too many anesthetic episodes. So that is also not good. And uh, we have a philosophy, if you can try to do more than one segment at a time, it's better. So originally we used to do both the thigh bones together and the leg bones together. Now we moved on to do one whole leg together because we open the knee only once on that side. So we can fix both top and bottom. How many are safe? We try not to do upper limbs and lower limbs together because that's a lot, takes a long time. There are issues of bleeding in osteogenesis. They bleed very easily. Uh, uh, and they also, the temperature increases, so we have to cool the children nowadays when we operate. We had one child with what we call metabolic acidosis soon after surgery. 
uh, not that we did four segments, just by doing two segments. So that's why I think it's very important to have tertiary centers uh, for both uh, medical treatment and for surgical treatment. We also have a spine surgeon uh, who's quite experienced now, uh, Mr. Co Ashley Cole. So uh, it's always good to have a good team uh, to deliver the best service. We do have complications. Most of the complications are related mainly due to the quality of bone. Pre-bisphosphonates, the bone was uh, brittle in its own way. Post-bisphosphonates, it's brittle in a different way. It's easy to crack it, but it's difficult to drill. So there's a big difference. When you drill, you create heat and heat kills cells. And then it can produce sort of less bone healing. What about implants? Because we have growth plates in children, we can only use uh, rods which have to grow with the, uh, the child's uh, uh, growth along the long bone. And these are very flimsy rods. They sometimes start from three millimeters. They can easily bend. And of course, because it's a difficult area, there's a learning curve for surgeons as well. And as the child grows, we have to keep changing these rods. And so there'll be more surgery as well. What should be the end results? Before we discharge, uh, we can treat till the about age of 18. For walkers, we want roughly equal leg lengths. We want a straight leg so that the axis uh, down the line from the center of the head to the ankle should go to the center of the knee, like you can see in this child who's got a good outcome. Uh, and functional joints. What about non-walkers? Possibly we should get them well seated, good spinal balance, stabilize the long bones, and uh, now we are concentrating more on the upper limbs as well because they have to use their wheelchair. So things have moved on. A bit about evolution of implants. Uh, you know, when they first started, they used to call fixed length rods. It's called a rush nail. And they had their own complications. Uh, you can see here, it grows out, comes out uh, into the muscle and so on. And then in 1963, the, uh, the Bailey-Duber rod came, which was sort of like a growing rod, but they had connecting T pieces. And the technique those days was to make big incisions, open the whole bone, cut it into different bits, and make it straight. So, so if you look at that, those days, the incisions were very long. Those things all have changed now as well. So there were also significant complications, as you can see with the bailey Duber rod and the original rod, almost 69% and 55%. But many of the complications were also because of revisions to exchange the rods. But there were, co there were more complications with the bailey Duber rod with the implant. As you can see here, the T piece sort of falls off. So in 1986, uh, one of my predecessors, Mr. Douglas, actually designed this Sheffield telescopic intermediate rod, which later with Mike Bell and so on, uh, they started using it. It is uh, hard-drawn stainless steel, but the T-piece is fixed. And then we looked at all these uh, between, done between 1986 and 1996, about 74 of them, as you can so see. Uh, more of them were of the type 1s. Some of them it's severe ones where you have four rods in all the four segments. And we looked at fracture incidents and you can see before rods what the fractures were and how the incidence of those fractures changed after rodding as you can see here. Similarly, what about means of mobilization? So people who are actually sitting on wheelchairs started to now do some walking with or without aids. So there was definite improvement in their mobility status. What about developmental milestones? This was looked at and you can see a big difference or jump in crawling, standing and walking after rotting. What about other things, including educational and social? This was also reviewed, and we looked at how many of them became independent. You can see 13 of them, mainstream school, driving with, with the standard or modified car, and even non-contact PE. We looked at this rod surviving compared to Bailey Duber rod. The Sheffield rod is surviving a bit longer, uh, which means less number of uh, repeat surgeries. There are complications, like I said, I'm not going to uh, tell you everything, but if you see most of the, though we say 42%, many of them are minor, 20% of course it was to exchange rods, which is not technically a complication of the surgery. So what happened uh, uh, with bisphosphonates was uh, Prof. Bishop came to Sheffield 
and then things all moved on and suddenly when we started to look at when we're doing surgery that the bone was more dense, uh, drill bits were not drilling very easily, uh, so we noticed a change in quality of bone. So there was a little bit of surgical implications because the canal of the bone was becoming narrow and initially we thought there was some delay in fracture healing but at that time we were also doing big, bigger incisions like the traditional style. We saw some little loosening in the initial years, some concerns, but actually since that initial concern, we don't actually see that anymore. At the same time, in the adult population, all for osteoporosis, they were giving bisphosphonates. And they started to see a new pattern of fractures in the thigh bone just below what is called the subtrochantric area. And at the same time, we also were noticing that there were a new pattern of fractures occurring in our children as well. And you can see, this is what we call the subtrochantric area. This is a classic fracture seen when you have marble bone disease, otherwise called as osteopetrosis. That's where they usually fracture. And then we thought we'll look at all our, all our, uh, our children who have had these fractures. And we published this paper, uh, Nick Nikola, who was a fellow at that time, uh, wrote it up for us. And we compared the historical group to the new group after bisphosphonates. And you can see even with the rod, they fracture at the same place. And then we looked at these two groups and you can see before pre-bisphosphonates, the fractures were almost throughout. But as soon as we gave bisphosphonates, the fractures were getting localized at one particular point. So there was a definite change uh, why uh, the bisphosphonate was doing it because that's most what is called the tensile side. The canal is now very narrow and it behaves on tension, it breaks very easily. So possibly these are the reasons because there's increased bone mass, uh, it's hypermineralized and behaves like marble bone. This is another example to show you. We all know that obese phosphonates outweigh the risk and we notice the changing pattern. And we also didn't know about whether, about duration and initiation of treatment, when to give treatment holidays during surgery, and whether the influence of where we cut the bone to, uh, to get the bone straight. So we had to change our techniques so that we could get better results. So nowadays, we make very tiny cuts and try to do lots of it under X-ray control. So there's no more big incisions, very tiny incisions. They may be multiple, but very tiny. We don't use saw anymore. We, we drill, but we cool the drill throughout so that the bone doesn't, uh, uh, bone cells don't die. We ask for new and sharp drills all the time. Quite often we have blunt drills. Uh, we originally used to rod the tibia with the uh, initial, uh, now we rod with a single rod. We have stopped doing Sheffield rods for the tibia because we had to open the ankle joint. Some of you may know the names of what is called fascia dual rod and the new called the TST rod which comes from Turkey. So we have moved on to use that for the tibia. For blood loss we use cell saver and we use a drug called tranexamic acid. It's very rare now that we transfuse for any osteogenesis now during our surgery. It's extremely rare and we cool the child uh, during the procedure. What are the other changes? So because of all these reasons, now we have started to intervene early to correct def uh, deformities. So like I said earlier, as soon as they get sitting balance and standing potential, uh, we, are, we think possibly we should be able to rod. We still skip a cycle before rotting and delay cycle after rotting for six weeks, but I don't think it makes a big difference because the technique has changed. We preserve the biology very well during surgery. We don't put big plasters anymore. We try to use removable braces. Anyone who comes with a fracture, we rot them uh, at the same time, uh, not necessarily the first fracture. And we revise them whenever required. This is just an example to show you an FD rod. This is all the planning we do nowadays. We got all software for that. Uh, and then this is just an FD rod which has got threaded end. We don't have to open the ankle joint for this. There are cheaper alternative rods. This is the rush rod which I used because I was forced to use because I couldn't get anything else at that time. And we thought we'll look at costs. With the recent Brexit, the dollar becomes stronger and our FD rod prices went up. Uh, it's even more than that now. Uh, the, these rods are cheaper and this has got an influence on, the, because NHS is a welfare state, we had to look at costs as well. But as 15 pounds is the rush rod, is the cheapest. The complication rate is a little higher, but not that we use it. It is used in the Eastern world, published from where I came from, from India. Good results, actually. 
What about adolescent things? Things have changed for adolescent fractures and deformities. So sometimes they come late to us, so bent bones, broken before, short. You can see we have done some planning. So we got now new rods, they are adult rods, but narrow in diameter, specifically for children. And we don't go to the, what's called the piriformis area. If you go through that adult way of doing it, we will compromise the blood supply to the ball of the thigh bone. So, and then we rod it, as you can see. Only thing is, when they become 16, we exchange it to a proper longer rod when they finish growth. Now we are protecting the bone throughout with growing rods and then we started noticing fractures here. So we have also changed now. So now we put in this rod we can use a screw and go right up to the neck. So now we protect the neck of the thigh bone. Yes, it is more metal but it reduces the chances of more fractures in adulthood. So the whole idea in treatment change is we are preparing a kid so that they don't have anything more to be done in adulthood if possible. So that's the whole idea. And this is what, so this child had growing rods, you know, legs were bent. We have changed it now to longer rods and protected the hip. So, so that's a good result. What else do we notice? We also notice coxavara. Coxavara is where the ball of the head and the neck bend because it's now protected only here. And then they crack here, so we have to fix it. So when they come with bent, when they are, they are bent so much, you don't walk properly. You, you get what is called a Tendlenburg gait. So we need to correct the angles. Again, you can see this is a narrow angle. We need to correct it to at least 130 degrees. So we can do that with a rod or a combination of rods and wire and so on. There are some plates as well. We also have the same problem. If you cut the bone there, sometimes the bone doesn't heal uh, in the same area, how you get the fracture there. So we also use called bone morphogenic protein or biologics. This is, it's also, it's costly, 2,200 pounds. But if you lace it, it's, I call it pixie dust, it works extremely well. What about, we might correct the long part of the long bone. What about the joints? The joint might be still bent. You could have knock knees or bow legs, like here as you can see. And then we put a tiny plate called guided growth, an eight plate. So we put a plate on the inner side as you can see. And slowly over time the legs come out straight. So that's a very simple technique. So we add all this so that the legs are roughly straight by the end of age 16. What about brittle bones? Can we lengthen them? Yes, because we have published it. So we've done quite a few. So you can lengthen on the rod with a rail we call it. And you can see new bone forming. Uh, and actually it's the new bone which forms in osteogenesis is still brittle bone but it forms quite well ahead so it, does, it doesn't shorten like, like any other reef or any other some of the other conditions where it takes a bit longer for bone to form. This girl had uh, almost 8.5 centimeter shortening, she had scoliosis uh, and the pelvis was oblique. So we lengthened her at multi-level so you can see a cage from top to bottom from the hip to the leg. And uh, this is soon after plaster removed. We did not want to correct all the eight centimeters because we just wanted to bring a shoulders level. So as you can see, that's how she was pre-operative and well balanced. So we don't just correct, we have to look at the spine and the pelvis to make sure the final balance is right. And then she went on to drive a car. She's an adult now, discharge. We now got an expensive toy also for lengthening. We don't have to use fixators anymore. This magnetic nail driven by a magnet inside is a magnet. There's some gears and it drives it. We use an external magnet. It costs 12,000 pounds. Yeah, so, so it creates bone. But the first one when I did, uh, did not throw good bone very well. I think it may be the residual influence of bisphosphonate again. So the next one I did, we went at a very slow pace and you can see good bone formation. So this is a nicer way of doing it. Yes, it is expensive, but the child doesn't have pins and wires put in the leg, so, and, and they bend their knee phenomenally well. So this is the new way of doing uh, lengthening for the older kids, we can't do it for the younger kids. We looked at our own outcomes, uh, the longest series may be published for 19 years, uh, which we published in the uh, journal, uh, journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. And we looked at 66 rods. I'm not going to go through all the details for you. And we'll just see a few things. So reduction of fractures. 
and the indications for reoperations, as you can see here, a uh, few things which are mentioned, but mainly because of growth. It's not a really a complication, but we put it there as a revision operation. The real complications, some had infection, and these are, of course, you should remember, done uh, yesteryears when they were big open operations, so the chance of infection is a bit, bit higher. Rod migration was a problem. But if you look at the mobility of the patient, you can see how many were wheelchair dependent in adulthood, how that number has changed. So there's a direct influence on stabilizing or rotting these children that their mobility improves. And mobility is so important, it maintains your bone strength as well. You should remember we are made to stand and walk and that's how our bone becomes strong. We looked at symptoms because of the rods growing to the top called the trochanter, so buttock symptoms we looked at. So they were the only ones, we, people who complained about near the buttock area, I think the rod was irritating their muscles there. Whereas at the knee, it was not a major problem, most of them had no symptoms. And similarly at the ankle, though we used to open the ankle joint, actually very few had problems at the ankle joint. They've stopped doing it though because it's a quite a big operation. We looked at what is called uh, uh, outcomes in the short form 36, I'm not going to go into detail. They are generally uh, sort of, you can see, they are still below the normal population, but definitely better than others. And we also compared it to uh, the mental domain, sorry, the mental domains as well. And similarly, they were compared to a scoliosis group and an United States Ojai cohort. So we had the similar results to the U.S. Uh, study as well. So 50% of the re-operations were mainly exchange of rods, 15% had rod disengagement, and none had complaints of the knee or ankle, and significant improvement in mobility. Of course, the outcomes cannot be compared to, to the normal population. They'll always be lower than the normal. So growing rods is still a reliable technique, well tolerated, and uh, we think it is still a little problem, uh, contrary to previous criticism about opening joints, and it definitely improves mobility and quality of life. And our results are roughly the same as the Montreal group and others, uh, uh, and uh, we have a lower rate of inter interventions, and possibly uh, at the moment only long-term outcome study uh, published in literature. So. For the lower limbs, I mean, we have definitely, with surgical stabilization, there's a good improvement to achieve walking milestones and social integration. Uh, bisphosphonate therapy has brought vast benefits, but we know how to deal with the altered fracture patterns, and also we can equalize limb lengths for the walkers as well. Let's move on to the upper limb. This is the difficult segments. We were not used to touch them before, but uh, recently we had uh, for the last two years, uh, most of our children or parents want us to do the arms. I don't know whether they're all on Facebook and somebody's telling each other, and I, that's what I hear. I think the first one I did, and then it suddenly we did about 14 arms, and in the recent past we've done quite a few forearms as well. So one of the problems with the humor eye or the arm bone is this is what we used to notice. They used to fracture somewhere here because they also had a deformity in the forearm and they never used to heal, and then they used to become like this, absolute non-union. So you can't use your arm if you've got a double elbow. So it almost works like a double elbow. So it's not stable, so you can't use functionally. Though we treated this, she did still went on to her persistently have a non-union. Since then, since after her, we have been a bit more uh, looking at arms and forearms in more detail, and we think if we get them at the right time and rod them at the right time. So we used to use a Sheffield rod before, but we had to go through the shoulder joint. We have moved on, now we go through the below, just above the elbow joint. So we looked at uh, the last, from between 2015 to early part of this uh, year, we, we looked at them. So basically we go through at the back of the elbow, that's the guide wire, and then we put a rod with threads here and locks, and then this across the growth plate. That's called a TST rod. But then we started to see that technically there were problems because this is a very weak area in the bone, sometimes they're fractures. So we do get fractures with this group. They go on to heal. Um, there were 10 patients, 14 procedures. Uh, and you can see some of the shapes we have. This is, I call a Z-shaped. This is almost like a shepherd's crook, I call it. 
is almost shaped like a boomerang. What you don't know is it looks wider. Actually, when you look at the bone, it's like a rib. It's narrow on the other side. So it becomes very technically difficult, uh, and we can only put the narrowest of narrow rods. And five of them had sustained a f some sort of fracture thereby because of so many reasons, anatomic reason, the quality of the bone. And the older the kid with bisphosphonates, we find they're even more difficult. They behave like marble, they, they crack. But anyway, we, they all went on to heal except one which was delayed. She's just about healing now. There's another risk, there's a radial nerve which sits close by, so we, every time we do this surgery, we are paranoid about it, so we always look at it to make sure that it is safe, and only then we, do we break the bone to put the rod in. So there is a risk of uh, iatrogenic fracture, but they go on to heal, and I think it could be also related to the length of bisphosphonate treatment. So we are slowly moving to putting these rods early so that we don't have to wait when they're older, because then technically they become difficult. What about forearms? If you see this, uh, this was the first one I did long time ago, and you can see this is uh, fractures which are not healing, bent almost, it's like a double elbow. Uh, and we correct it uh, just with one wire, we just break the other bone just with closed, or just a gentle pressure, and they go on to heal well. Uh, you don't need a wire on the other side. If you try to correct both with open surgery, uh, there'll be a lot of bleeding and we can get complications of what is called compartment syndrome. So I usually just rod one and then get the arm or forearm to look what it should look like. The x-ray may look zigzag, but, but the forearm, when you look at the child, looks, looks almost normal. So you can see here one is almost 90 degrees bent. And then for this we put two wires, as you can see, because both had, and then almost a straight, straight forearm. So now we have more and more children asking for requests for forearms and families. And from our occupational therapists and physiotherapists, they think that uh, there's uh, functional benefits and improved function overall. But we are just going to look at prospectively evaluating outcomes and uh, compared to historical patients who haven't had any surgery done on their forearms. I think it also improves aesthetics and reduces fractures. What about type 5 forearms? Uh, as you know, in type 5, they produce extra bone. Uh, we still do not have a, a solution for it unless we are forced to do an operation. So at the moment, we are not touching them. So final conclusion, there's a steep surgical learning curve. We've got more improvements needed to be done in implants and reduced costs. We have uh, got a Rolls-Royce company who might be helping us with designing some new rods. Uh, we're looking more at upper limbs. We're looking at more outcomes and research breakthroughs. I haven't spoken anything about the pelvis because we don't have much answers at the moment for the pelvis. Uh, uh, but I think the most important thing is the multidisciplinary team approach and all our adorable OI families which uh, mainstay for success. Thank you very much.